Perfect. All right. I'd like to welcome everyone to a, our lakeside chat on financial aid. Tonight, we have Stephen Jagard here from John Hancock talking to us about um, the FAFSA changes that are coming up this year and uh, just some of the info that we might need for 529s and um, financial planning in general or financial aid in general. And I know as a parent with a sophomore in college that this information is very useful and that the whole process is actually pretty overwhelming. So having you here, Stephen, to kind of clarify some of this and um, bring answer some of these questions that people might have is really an awesome opportunity. So we appreciate you being here. Yeah, of course. Thank you so much for having me. Um, yeah, so my name is Stephen Jagard. I'm the 529 specialist covering the Northeast states at John Hancock. Uh, mainly, I focus on our, our 529 plan. I partner with a lot of financial advisors uh, in the Northeastern states on really how to take advantage of our 529 and use it properly. Um, but I'm not talking about our 529 today. I'm going to full, focus fully, so, solely focus, excuse me, on financial aid. Um, and I'm really going to hone in on the expected family contribution formula and kind of give a bit of a breakdown there, as well as go over some of the changes coming to FAFSA for uh, this upcoming application and starting next year. So this is meant to be purely educational. Um, I guess we'll, we'll do a little Q&A at the end for anyone who's on as well. But, um, you know, Adam and Christina, feel free to cut me off if you have any questions or want to chime in with something else. But we'll keep things pretty high level to begin and, and then get a little more in the weeds as we go along. So with that being said, what is financial aid? Well, financial aid comes from a lot of different places. It could be from the government, it could be from the school, it could be from uh, private parties, and it can be from different types of organizations that are maybe offering private scholarships. And it'll come in really two forms. One is self-help, and then the second is gift aid. Self-help is any type of aid that needs to be repaid. The best example there, and the most common one, of course, is going to be student loans. Gift aid is money that is gifted that does not need to be repaid. So that will be things like merits or grants, and of course, scholarships directly, where it's gifted, you don't need to give it back in any way, shape, or form. How financial aid is determined is going to be based on either a financial need, or it can be based on a student's merit, whether that merit is athletic, academic, or based on maybe some talent that the school desires. How financial aid is calculated is through the following formula. It's the cost of attendance, which is basically everything that goes into the total cost of going to a school, you know, room and board, tuition, textbooks, fees, all that stuff, minus what's known as the expected family contribution. And this is the real buzz phrase, especially when it comes to FAFSA and federal aid. So the chart on this next slide really kind of hones in on the numbers that go into a lot of that equation. So as you can see, there are two components here. There's an expected student contribution and an expected family contribution. Each has two subcomponents, income and assets. So we'll start on the left-hand side with expected student contribution. Well, for most students, they don't make much money or they don't have many assets in their name. So majority of people won't really have that much of an impact from a student perspective on financial aid. Now, of course, if they have a really lucrative part-time job, that might have a bit of an impact. There's an allowance of about $7,000 before that 50% of student income kicks in. So most people can have like, you know, a summer job or a part-time job during school and not have to worry about having any sort of impact on federal aid eligibility. Student assets, that 20%, there's no allowance there, but we really only see that having a big impact if maybe there's like an UGMA Utman account or a custodial account in the child's name. And that account, of course, has maybe, you know, tens of thousands, if not a couple hundred thousand dollars in it. Expected family contribution works a little bit differently. So the good thing with the expected family contribution, assets actually don't play as big of a role as people think in this equation. So you can see here up to 5.64% of parent assets are included in determining federal aid eligibility. And that 5.64% does not include things like home equity and does not include retirement accounts. So which primarily make up the dominant amount of people's net worth. So things like a savings account or a checking account, assets in a 529 plan or a brokerage account, CDs, assets at a bank, 
those will be factored into the equation. So simply put, if you have a parent owned 529 with $100,000 in it, about $5,600 would go against aid eligibility. Again, most people, assets are not going to have the big impact. Where the big impact comes into play is parent income. So you see a range here of about 22 to 47%. Don't look at that as apples to apples, where if you're making $100,000 a year, you're expected to contribute $47,000 per year towards education. That's not necessarily true. There are different allowances and deductions that go into this. And really where you fall in this range pretty much depends on how fast is filled out. And that's going to be different for everybody. So, but that is where people have probably the biggest hit when it comes to federal aid eligibility. And this next chart really gives a good illustration of how that plays out. So we have on the x-axis here, uh, countable assets in the formula. So again, assets that don't include primary residence and retirement accounts. And on the y-axis, we have income. And that in those income levels are only going up in increments of $25,000. So every number in the middle here, these are estimated EFC numbers, EFC being expected family contribution, meaning that don't look at this and say to yourself, all right, if I have 200,000 countable assets and make 100,000 a year, my EFC is automatically $26,800. Again, it's not that apples to apples and everyone fills out FAFSA differently, but this chart does portray a very relevant trend. And if we go from left to right in the columns in this chart, you can see that the expected family contribution really isn't going up that much as we're increasing even by you know $50,000 in assets. However, if you start to go down the rows in increments of only 25,000 in income, you're going to start to see a substantial jump in the expected family contribution. So again, these are estimates, but the trend is very clear. Income has a much bigger impact than assets. So this is really just to set expectations. Of course, there are many ways to get different types of aid, but when it comes to federal aid, income is the big thing that you wanna look at. And getting a good understanding of where your income bracket is, and that income is AGI, adjusted gross income, by the way, can really help you get a good understanding of if you should lean on FAFSA a little bit more, or if you should look towards other areas of getting financial aid, whether that is from schools or private scholarship money, or of course, you know, funding 529 and in a last case resort, taking out student loans. So a couple important dates to be mindful of for FAFSA. Um, the first one, October 1st. So FAFSA opens up every year on October 1st for the upcoming school year. So for example, if you're starting school in 2024, 2025, you want to be applying for that application that opens in probably about three weeks from now, roughly. So that's important because federal aid is given out on a rolling basis and it's a finite amount. So simply put, the longer you wait to submit those applications, the less likely it is you're going to get all the aid that you're eligible for. So especially if you're in a lower income bracket, you absolutely want to be getting that FAFSA application in as close to that October 1st date as possible. A second thing that we want to be mindful of is the timing of when income and assets are factored in. So what do I mean by that? Well, when you look at your income, and where at least when FAFSA looks at your income, they're actually looking at your income from two years prior. It's known as a prior, prior look back or a two-year look back. So if you apply for federal aid in 2023, they're going to look at your income situation for 2021. Assets, however, whatever your situation is with your accounts that you have, those will be reported as of the day you file for FAFSA. So if you apply October 5th, they're going to look at your asset situation on October 5th, and that is how that'll be factored in. So those are a couple of things that I would say you definitely want to be mindful of when you're Applying for FAFSA, it gives you an idea of where you might land in terms of expected family contribution. Um, there are also some great calculators online that you can play around with that will give you some bit of an estimate of where you might stand. Of course, with those calculators, you know, they're only as accurate as much information you put into it. So the more you put in, you know, the better estimate you'll get out of it. So moving forward, we wanted to highlight a handful of changes that are coming to FAFSA for this application starting next year, 2024, 2025. So there are six of them that we highlighted that we think are going to be very relevant. Um, of course, there are more than these, but we thought that these six are the ones that people are probably going to see uh, be talked about, the, talked about the most, and you'll probably see a direct impact. So first and foremost, FAFSA is going to be shorter. 
It's going to be about 108 questions down to 36. Right now, it's six pages. It'll be cut down to about two. The whole idea there, and obviously this benefits everyone, is that it's a lot easier to fill out and less time consuming. I've personally never filled out FAFSA myself, but I've been told it is very cumbersome. Um, and Christina, you mentioned that before. You're nodding your head right now. I can see you on my other monitor. Um, but it, it's not a fun process. And there's a lot of paperwork that you have to collect. And there is, you know, you have to sit down and do this. It might take even hours or a day or so. But a lot of that, unfortunately, deterred many people from applying at all. So the whole idea behind this, if you make it shorter and easier to fill out, more people will be filling it out. Expected family contribution is going to be renamed. So that table that I brought up, brought up about five slides ago, um, that is the expected family contribution table. The formula itself is not changing in any substantial way, shape, or form. They're just renaming it now to the student aid index. That is just a name change. But you want to be mindful of this because when you hear or see student aid index, you want to know that what they're referring to is the expected family contribution formula. Um, Again, this is, this is more of a kind of psychological change. Not many people like the government telling them they're expected to pay a certain amount for education. So they're simply changing it to the student aid index, but it's not going to make the process any easier or unfortunately college more affordable. The next change is a change for divorced and separated parents. So this one, of course, is a bit more niche and a bit more specific to certain individuals in a more specific situation. But the way that you could fill out FAFSA is that it could be completed by the parent where the child spent the majority of the time. So in short, you could essentially say that the child was with the parent who makes less income and that parent would file for FAFSA because of course, if you have a lower income and lower assets, you're more likely to get more money. Going forward, however, it is going to need to be completed by the parent who provides greater financial support to the child. Essentially, whoever is the person claiming them come tax season, that is the person that should be filling out FAFSA. So those are going to need to match up going forward. Um, so that's something you want to be mindful of. Again, it's, it's a more specific situation. But if you have two parents that have a pretty large discrepancy in the amount of income that they bring in, that can have a big impact for certain families and individuals. The next change, changes in treatment of multiple family members enrolled at the same time. So unfortunately, this is a negative change. I will just be upfront about that. I'm assuming this was kind of put in there more for budget reasons than anything else. Um, so basically, the way that FAFSA calculates this now is that if you have multiple kids in school at the same time, whether it's twins in the same grade or you have maybe a sophomore and a senior overlapping, um, they would basically give you a break on the expected family contribution. So if you had two kids, it was cut in half, three, it was cut in two thirds. If you had four, it was even cut up to 75%, which is a, a pretty big break. So you could get a lot more aid if you had multiple kids in school at the same time. Well, going forward, unfortunately, that is going to be removed. And the new FAFSA is not going to be dividing up the expected family contribution. So again, I'm, I'm not a fan of this change. Of course, it, it does mean less aid for multi-student families. Um, so unfortunately, if, if you have multiple kids in school right now and you're applying for FAFSA next year, you're probably going to see less aid than you're used to if you are getting federal aid. The next change, change to income protection levels. So this could be a little confusing at first, but simply put, there are allowances that are factored in before the income percentages that I showed you on that chart a handful of slides ago in the expected family contribution formula, there are allowances before that kicks in. So I mentioned with students, it's about $7,000 right now before 50% of their income over that $7,000 is factored in. Same thing with the parents. It works a little bit differently, but there are allowances based on your family situation. So it's more or less those allowances are going to be increasing. Parental income goes up by about 20%. Student income goes up by about 35%. All this really means is that more of a student and a parent's income is not going to be factored into the equation. So you would see people who have income pricing them out in particular. You'll probably see a little bit more aid compared to what you had before if you were getting aid to begin with. Um, so that's definitely a positive thing, especially if you're lower income, you will more than likely see an increase there. Um, when it comes to assets, 
that remains unchanged. So again, home equity, retirement assets, you know, value of annuities and the value of cash value life insurance policies, those will not be included in the equation. Um, I will make a quick side note when I mention annuities and cash value life policies. I have seen and heard of different companies trying to sell individuals those types of investment products for the sake of increasing aid eligibility. Um, again, that's a, a bit of a slippery slope. Just be careful when you're talking to those type of, types of companies because, like we mentioned, you know, assets have a very small impact. And if you do take, you know, if you do buy an annuity or cash value life insurance policy and take from it whilst a child is in school, it is actually viewed as income in that equation. So that in theory could backfire on you a bit. But at the end of the day, most people do not need to be buying other expensive investment vehicles in order to potentially increase federal aid eligibility. So I would just be a little bit mindful of that if you do come across people claiming they can get you more aid by selling you a certain investment product. And the last change that I will mention is what we call grandparent giving. So right now, as it stands, if you are a parent owning a 529 plan, uh, the assets in that 529 are factored in only about, again, 5.6%, which is not much. And then when you take distributions, income is not looked at as anyone, whether it's the child or the parent slash account owner. If you have a grandparent or non-parent owned 529 as it stands now, the assets are not looked at at all, but when you take a distribution, it is looked at as income, albeit with a two-year look-back period, but a grandparent or non-parent on 529, the distributions would be viewed as income. Good thing going forward is that they are completely removing that. So no longer will distributions from non-parent owned 529s have any sort of impact on federal aid eligibility, which is a great thing because it removes any hesitation from outside family members um, contributing to a 529 plan with the fear that they might impact federal aid for a child. So that's a great thing. Obviously, as you know, a financial advising team, I'm, I'm sure you want to hear that so you can have more conversations with some of your elder clients and grandparent clients, but it really just encourages more crowdfunding within 529 plans. And 529s, if you know anyone here on the call hasn't worked with them before, anyone can contribute to those. So they do become a great crowdfunding vehicle if you want other family members or friends to help contribute to a child's 529 plan. So overall, this is definitely a positive change and all the more reason why if a grandparent's willing to help fund a grandchild's education, they should know that definitively going forward, it won't have an impact on federal aid eligibility. So with that being said, I wanted to kind of sum up some best practices for potentially increasing aid eligibility. Again, no guarantee, but things that I've come across that I think anyone can really take home. First and foremost, there's no harm in applying for FAFSA every year. There's no such thing as hiding assets. That is a complete myth. If the you're not hiding them from the government or the school or anybody else by not applying for FAFSA. In fact, most schools actually do require you to apply for FAFSA or at least fill out CSS profile in order for them to even consider giving you any type of aid, whether it is need-based or merit-based. So, and by the way, every school has their own formula for calculating aid. It is, they use information from FAFSA, but they don't use the same formula. So the only way to really know how a school determines how they give out aid is to basically talk to them directly and get an understanding through the financial aid office. Apply to as close to that October 1st date as possible when it comes to FAFSA. Again, a finite amount is distributed. The sooner you get that application in, the more likely it is you're going to get all the aid that you're eligible for. For those that price themselves out of FAFSA and federal aid, don't overlook merit or need-based aid from schools. Schools are often very flexible. They often have different tiers of aid packages that they give out. And a lot of times people can actually negotiate and put schools up against each other to increase aid eligibility. So especially for some higher income individuals that again, don't get federal aid, that's probably the best route that you wanna go. Scholarships also can play a big role. When I say scholarships, I mean private third-party scholarships. There are a lot of great websites out there like scholarships.com, fastweb.com, where 
you can actually apply to these types of scholarships. And there are billions of dollars worth out there. They come from, you know, third party organizations. It could be a it could theoretically be a government organization, but usually it's some sort of nonprofit or charity or uh, other type of organization it could be the military where they're encouraging certain and they're basically giving out scholarships. And these websites are the places that put them all really in one spot. Understand how assets and income impact aid for a client. That's basically what we talked about with the expected family contribution. And at the end of the day, don't overthink this. Um, when it comes to federal aid and FAFSA, it's a pretty straightforward process. There really aren't many loopholes or games to play. And be mindful about paying for advice. Like I said, um, everything up here, we're kind of giving to you for free. Admittedly, we collected this information online from different government websites and just put it together in a PowerPoint presentation and got it approved. So, you know, there are best practices, but be careful about gaming it and spending too much time on it because I've seen a lot of people go down a rabbit hole with that when they don't need to. Um, and obviously with this stuff, it's it's never necessarily fun to begin with, as, as you all know. So uh, we just want to make this as seamless as possible educate you so you can set expectations for yourself and your families and get a good idea of, you know, the best way to avoid paying full sticker price for any college or institution. So with that being said, that's, that's pretty much the end of my presentation. Um, Adam, Christina, thank you so much to you both and the team for having me on and uh, for whoever's on the call, uh, we can open things up to a bit of a Q and a um, and go from there. Awesome. Thank you, Stephen. Lots of information in there. Um, I do have a question to get us started, actually. Of course. So, and, I, and I'm going to put you on the spot. I probably should have warned you ahead of time I was going to ask this, but I had okay. sent the information about this chat to um, a local school, and they responded that they were told that the FAFSA this year is not opening up until January 1st. Do you have any idea if that's accurate? Yeah, it's probably something I should have brought up in this presentation. Sometimes I go through it just to stay on script, but uh, it is getting pushed back a bit this year. So uh -huh. I think um, I have to double check. I, I haven't read that in a little bit, admittedly. Um, I think there are certain individuals who'd be able to apply earlier, but for the most part, it's this year it's going to be getting pushed back. And that's okay. so these, they can fully implement these changes, which frankly should have been fully implemented already. Right. I mean, they announced them two years ago, right? So two years ago and pushed them back a year. <laughs> so, but. Yeah, so it's our government. Okay, gotcha. Um, and then, so one of the things that uh, I was thinking as you were going through that is that people should know to complete the FAFSA regardless of if they think that they're going to qualify for any kind of um, reduction in the, the cost of college because it, it, all the schools you were saying look at it, but also in New York State, and I don't know if you're if you're in New York State or not, but New York State also bases their information off of that. So even if you don't qualify for financial aid, right, the New York State will give you merit based aid um, based on the information that you provide in the FAFSA. So it can be very useful. Correct. Yeah. So when I say everyone can apply for FAFSA, again, it's more just I don't want people to be just not apply because they think they'll hide assets. Exactly. Um, don't get me wrong. If you make like half a million a year, it's probably not worth your time. <laughs> but, you know, if, if you're in the range of kind of income that I was showing you on the chart before, so anywhere from, you know, zero to zero to 100K, you should absolutely be applying. 100 to 200 is, you know, start to taper expectations to 250 and up. I would understand if you don't apply, but a lot of the schools are still going to require you fill that out, especially again, New York. I am, I actually live in Manhattan. Um, and I've heard that from many advisors tell me that actually who I've done these types of webinars with that that's the case with New York. And yeah. New York. And so um, there's another form that people that some schools may have you fill out. Is that correct? Other than the FAFSA? Yeah, it's called the CSS profile. Um, it is not as largely used as the FAFSA, but there are schools that it's a little more in-depth and comprehensive. So schools will use that sometimes in lieu, in addition to the FAFSA, and they'll use information from there to determine how the school in particular is going to be giving you your aid package if you're going to get one. Fun, fun. Any <laughs> questions out there? I don't hear any. I don't see any. Um, Adam, I know you're a little bit away from this, but any thoughts on your part? 
Uh, yeah, thankfully, I am still a little ways away from this. Uh, but I would say, um, according to a lot of your charts, it seems to me like one of the better things that that some people may be able to do that might also line up well with their um, kind of where they are in their in their work career path. Uh, by the time that their kids are college age would potentially be to increase their retirement contributions that potentially could lower their income for your chart, like you were talking about, and then retirement assets are included in the calculation. Yeah, that's correct. So yeah, I would always say, you know, if it makes sense in their overall financial plan, uh, that's definitely an option. The other thing I've seen people do and is pay down debt right before they apply because again ask like like that's not looked at in this whole equation basically so if you pay down your debt you're basically you're taking assets out of a checking your savings account and lowering that impact again it's not big but it's a good rule of thumb and in general i think it's just a good you know kind of practice for anyone financially to pay off sure. that sooner rather than later but like it's all got to make sense in the big picture you know what i mean for sure yeah. So it's interesting that you said don't pay for advice, because I think that there are a lot of people out there that charge for that. And because it is such a confusing and overwhelming time as a parent that's never had to do this. And all of a sudden, you know, but two pages, you said that's what it's going down to or six pages. Yeah, six pages down to two. Um, I shouldn't say, you know, don't pay for advice. It's more be mindful about it because I've seen them trap people that don't need to go through that. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, with certain people, it can help. But I've never seen it where there wasn't some sort of like quid pro quo situation. Right. Going on. So it's, it's just be mindful of that. It's, it's, it's a business. And at the end of the day, there's not that many loopholes to this. So I don't really know. I, I think they're just kind of regurgitating the same information and maybe helping you get more money from the schools, which that's understandable because in certain situations, you can't get a lot of money from the schools. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. All right. Well, we appreciate it. I'm going to oh, say one more time. Any questions? All right. No questions. Thank you very much for your time tonight, Stephen. We really appreciate it. And uh, hope you have a great, eat, great rest of the evening. And as you can see from the sun standing on my face here, that it's, uh, it's very sunny at the moment. <laughs> they didn't <laughs> want to stand up and close the blinds and everything. So thank you very much for your time tonight. Yeah, of course. Thanks for having me. And if any questions come up that uh, you want to reach out to me, I'm, I'm happy to answer them. And uh, I look forward to the next time we chat. All right. Thank you. Awesome. Bye. Thanks. Good night. Bye.